His website says it all. Jonathan Little, teaching you to win at poker. This guy's a previous guest. He's one of the hardest working guys in the game today. If he's not writing strategy books, he's live streaming on Twitch, doing a training video, coaching someone, or he's out there grinding, going deep in poker tournaments. Season 6 WPT Player of the Year. He's won two WPT titles, the Mirage Poker Showdown and the Foxwoods World Finals. Author of nine books, including the best-selling Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. One of the best, folks. Jonathan Little, thanks for joining us, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. That was a fun intro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I checked the Hendon Mob database, as I always do, and man, oh man, 2016 alone, you had a cash on the EPT, two caches on the WPT, and five caches at the World Series of Poker. I'm just wondering, where do you find time with all your side projects to keep playing at the top level? Oh, well, that, that's a difficult, that's an interesting question, I suppose. Um, I try to compartmentalize my life where I play poker pretty hard for about two weeks per month, and then the other two weeks per month, I tend to go home and work on the various side projects. And whenever I'm playing poker, I tend to not deal with the business side of things. Whenever I'm dealing with the business side of things, I don't play poker. So I found that that works pretty well for me, and it lets me get a lot done. Man, you're busy. I see you on Twitter, the social networks on Twitch. You seem to have it all managed so that everything is working together, the books, the coaching, the poker, Twitch, your webinars, training videos. Seems like you're running a machine right now, man. I'd be remiss if I didn't compliment you on that. You just mentioned it, two weeks on, two weeks off, and it's all working together. Yeah, I mean, it took a long time to figure out how to do it all. I've been doing uh, some something similar to this for the last, I guess, 10 years now. And, you know, the first few years, it was not going incredibly well. But after, over time, you know, you just keep doing good work and people notice it and things take off. Listen, at the World Series of Poker, there was a new event this year, the Tag Team event, and I was surprised. I check all the updates, man. I'm right into poker, poker junkie, and there you were going deep in that event with your parents. I mean, that must have been a thrill for you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. My dad comes to the, well, my parents come to the Las Vegas every summer during the World Series of Poker. They like to hang out with me for a week or two, and there were no more $1,000 tournaments. My dad plays 1500s and smaller for the most part and i saw there was a team tournament and he was just didn't even look at the team tournament because you know what team is he going to play on and so i said well i'll play and then my mom said oh i'll play <laughs> and uh, we we got on we, we did the team tournament together it was a lot of fun and my parents both did great they had a lot of they had, they had a good time playing every time my mom would sit down to play she would win then my dad would sit down he would win for a while then inevitably bluff off half the stack <laughs> then, I, then i would come back rebuild the stack my mom would win some dad would come back and bluff it off you know that, that's how it went so it was a lot of fun so you came ninth you went deep you must have had visions of a family bracelet uh by all accounts it seems like your mom's the better poker player well yeah she's the one who won every time <laughs> it was it was a tough tournament because uh, there was one point where i'm trying to think what happened we were we were relatively short stacked but there was a situation where someone raised from early position i three bet with queens and then I offered my like 25 big blind stacks. So I was pretty short. Then the player in the big blind who had been friendly with my mom the whole time, talking with me, telling me that he loves my books. He all of a sudden four bets. And, you know, with Queens, you're just normally thinking, well, I have to go here, obviously. And I'm about to put my money in. Then he kind of winks at me <laughs> and I'm thinking what's happening here. And I decided to fold and he claims he had aces, but I folded that when we were down to maybe 50 people or so. And we ended up making a deep run and taking ninth place. And, you know, when we got it in for ninth place, we I think we had ace-jack versus ace-eight and we lost. So even then we had tons of equity, but it just did not work out that time. But, yeah, I thought we were going to win for sure. So you liked that event. It seemed like it was a fun event, different than the stress of playing, you know, you know, on your own kind of thing. It's a very different environment because the rail is very invested because all the people on all the teams were watching as the tournament got towards the final stages. So... You had to be on a team of at least two people, but most of the teams were three or four people. So everyone had at least well two or three people railing them and really caring about what happened. So it was it was an interesting rail and something that does not happen very often. So last year at the World Series of Poker, I was watching it on the live stream. Uh, you made the final table, no limit hold'em, eight-handed. I mean, you must have been excited about that. Do you have visions of the bracelet while you're playing, or are you trying to stay right in the moment? So that was another interesting spot because my book, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, which I've been working on for about two years, just came out that day of the final table. So it was almost like, obviously, I'm going to win this. This right. would be perfect. But uh, I don't think you have visions of the bracelet or anything like that. I just try to show up and play my best every time. And 
I realize my job as a professional poker player is to show up and make the most amount of equity, whatever that means. That typically just turns into play your best and don't worry about the results. So that's that's what I tend to do. And things went, things started off well. I won a flip at the beginning of the final table, and then in the middle I lost a flip, and then I was out. So I think I took, I don't even know what I took, fifth or sixth or something like that. But it was a, it was a good time. It was, it's always good to make final tables at the World Series of Poker because it's a lot harder than people think. I think a lot of people just assume that every pro goes out there and final tables something every year, and that's just not the case. Very often you're going to have a bad series. So whenever you can final table something, it makes it not so bad. I mean, well, this year I took, uh, we took ninth in the team tournament for, I think something like $4,000 each, which is not a whole lot of money. So uh, I, I got to final table of world series event this year, but it did not work out because I still ended up down a decent amount. What did you think of the final table of the main event? I, I know you had to be watching, probably making a training video on a couple of those key hands. Um, key win wins it, it played very aggressive uh, were you watching in disbelief as his opponents kept laying it down, or what would you have done in that situation? Well, actually, last night I did a webinar. It's about four hours long where we went through 25 of the major hands from the final table. So I've been through a ton of them. We went through, we analyzed them, and tried to figure out what people could have done better, what, what people did well, et cetera. And that, you, you kind of summed it up. People kept folding too often. Whenever you're against someone who is pretty aggressive, you just cannot fold. And there were many spots where his opponents would fold, and – I think a lot of people thought that because they all had a lot of chips, uh, many big blinds in front of them, that they could play somewhat tightly, make top pair, top kicker, and then not fold it. And it's pretty hard to make top pair, top kicker when he's going to blast off. Because it's not like he was blasting off every time. He was actually playing pretty well in that he was betting with his best hands and his worst hands. So he's playing a polarized strategy, which is generally difficult to play against. He's probably bluffing a little bit too often, but it's fine if people are folding. I mean, he played the exact perfect strategy for his particular situation okay so you're gordon veo then your head's up for the world championship this guy's barreling uh what would you have done what, would you have made a stand somewhere or would you just have turned the tables and played more aggressive than him i think i, I would have just let him continue bluffing you just have to go call 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 a lot so there was one hand where he had ace nine and i think the flop came ace ten nine or something like that so he flopped two pair gordon did with a flush draw and when check raised him on the flop when had a flush draw Turn was a low card, went bet again. And a lot of people in that spot just raised the turn, but I think calling's actually the best play by far. The turn was a king. Then the river was another king that brought the club. So all the draws got there, and he got counterfeited. And when went all in, and Vio folded. And I think that spot is a good fold, because uh, we ran some numbers and uh, in, in the webinar last night, and basically Wen had to be bluffing with all of his busted straight draws and only be value betting with a few flushes in order to make a call there right. So that was a good fold. But then there was another hand a little while later where Vio had queen nine on nine three two, I think it was. So I think he raised and maybe when three bet or when check raised the flop, one of the two. Anyway, when decided to blast off, bet, bet, bet on the flop turn and river and Vio folded by the river. And that's the spot where you just have to call. So Vio recognized that he was just playing this really trappy strategy, but I think he should have been trapping with a little bit of a wider range and I think that would have worked out better for him. So the right strategy, wrong range. Pretty much. I, I think all the players were just playing a little bit too tightly. They wanted to know they had him beat instead of just being you know, pretty confident that they had him beat. And the other key hand that night uh, was with Cliff Josephy when they set over set. Uh, could you have got away from that hand, or is it tough in that spot? I'm, I'm not a big fan of folding sets three-handed in three-bet pots. Right. It's just not what you're trying to do. And the only time you can realistically fold there is if you are incredibly confident that Bio never bluffs, never overvalues a hand like pocket aces or ace king or something like that. And also you have to assume that he has some number of floated straight draws in his range, which may not be the case as well. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're folding a hand that's very near the top of your range. And you know some people may say that Cliff's pocket twos was actually in the middle or the bottom of his range, saying that he could have all the straight draws. That, that got there on the turn, but at the end of the day, I'm not trying to fold a set. Three-handed in a three-bet three, three bet pot. You just played and cashed the uh, Chad Brown Memorial Tournament. I'm wondering, as your stature grows in the game, Jonathan, are you playing more of these charity events, trying to give back, so to speak? I've been playing charity tournaments for a long time. Every time I have the opportunity, I go to play them. Um, I played one, well, just the Chad Brown one, like you said, in Atlantic City at the Poker Stars Festival, and then the week before that, I played in the, it's called the Chop Tournament. What is it called? Children's Hospital of Philadelphia tournament in Manhattan that Phil Helmuth MCs, and that always gets a, a lot of people, and they raise a bunch of money. So I, I try to play all the charity tournaments that I can. I think it's a, it's a good, easy way for poker players to give back. 
That Chad Brown Memorial must have been a special event. I mean, I, I never met the guy, but I hear he was a real good one. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've only interacted with him a few times, but he was always very nice to me, and you know, he didn't know me from any other online kid, so he, was just, he seemed to be a, a great guy to me. Okay, books. You've written nine now, by my count, probably working on your tenth as we speak. You just sent me a copy of uh, Bluff, How to Intelligently Apply Aggression to Increase Your Profit in Poker. You sent out a tweet saying, I'm writing a blog, need some ideas, and I sent you a, a reply saying, how about a guy who plays overly tight trying to learn how to bluff and be more aggressive? You know, I'm one of these guys that uh, I give my opponent too much credit, so it's something I, I have to overcome. Yeah, well, fortunately, you asked a question that I've already written a book on, so it made made it easy to send you a reply. But I do appreciate uh, the book, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Uh, that's a book that actually came about because uh, one of my students, Albert Hart, he went from being a very tight, passive player with effectively no results to now this year he's cashed for over $100,000 in live tournaments, and he's doing well online as well. And he just started being more aggressive. You know, He, he was one of my private students for a little while, and he took – diligent notes on everything that we discussed and it came out there were about 18 points that I was being more aggressive 18 situations where I suggested being more aggressive where he was typically being tight so we wrote about all those we used I think something like 80 hand examples and just really detailed how to get out of line if you are a somewhat tight passive player and especially if you're a tight passive player and your opponents think you're a tight passive player your bluffs are going to work really well especially whenever you first start doing them so it's worked out really well for him and and the book has been pretty successful it's helping a lot of people get out of their comfort zones and steal pots that don't belong to them that's got to make you feel good eh? one of your students goes on to be very profitable and he's having a good time doing what he loves and and you helped him i mean that's got to feel good yeah well i have a lot of students who have have this kind of result where they are you know they're they like playing poker they're not particularly good at poker but they want to be good at poker because they like playing it and they'd rather be profitable than not so they come to me for coaching or even they just read my books and study my training materials. And quite often they end up doing better because they go from not studying and not thinking about the game away from the table as they should to doing that kind of thing. So it helps them improve their game and learn to enjoy poker even more. Well, again, I appreciate the copy of Bluff. I just got it. I am going to read it. Some of your other titles include Crushing, Small Stakes Poker Tournament, Secrets of Professional Poker, Positive Poker, Insta Poker Coach. You can check them all out at jonathanlittlepoker.com. Tell us about these training packs, Jonathan. Instapoker, available on iPads, iPods, and the iPhone? Yeah, so Instapoker is a program that I'm involved with, well, it's an app that I'm involved with, where basically the a pro, myself, people like Antonio Esfandiari, Dan O'Brien, and a lot of other great pros, they put together a hand pack that's maybe, let's say, 20 hands, and it's like a quiz. So they'll deal out the cards, It'll fold around to you or someone will raise, whatever. And it'll say, do you want to fold, call, raise, or raise small or raise big? And then you click whichever option you want. And then a pop-up will come up telling you if it's if you pick the right play and why. Or if you pick the wrong play, it'll tell you that you picked the wrong play and why. And you can effectively quiz yourself and see what the pros are doing in all of these spots. So it's a really good interactive way to learn. I've actually um, taken that concept a little bit farther on my poker training site, pokercoaching.com, where we have a bunch of hand quizzes, but instead of the popping up with, you know, just text, it comes up with uh, like an audio, like a video. So it actually has me going over the situations. And also in addition to that, we have a monthly homework question where it's usually a pretty in-depth question. Like everyone folds to you in the small blind. This is one we did recently. Um, everyone folds to you in the small blind with 100 big blind stacks early in a tournament, and the player in the big blind is a you know, generally good, aggressive player. What is your strategy with each part of your range? And all the students submit their answers, and then we have a webinar that usually takes about two hours where we go through a lot of the answers. I review all the answers personally, and we try to develop strategies for these situations that come up somewhat often in tournaments and cash games. So it's a, it's a good interactive way to learn. But I, I think that a lot of people have become accustomed to watching videos and not really working hard to learn from the videos. And I want to figure out ways like Instapoker and PokerCoaching.com to get people engaged and learning. And I think that that's a, a good way to go about it. I mean, uh, poker is so diverse. Are you getting all kinds of students, like every type of player? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, they, they range from relatively beginning players to pretty advanced players. So uh, it, it, this, the spectrum is pretty broad. And are you still busy with FloatTheTurn.com? Yeah, Float the Turn is another poker training site I'm involved with. We've been updating it a decent amount, actually. So we have a new application that we just put out, the Float the Turn Push Fold app that has 
uh, a way for you to figure out how to use a push fold strategy at the poker table. It's really easy to move from hand to hand, uh, move up a number of big blinds, down a number of big blinds with just one click. And that makes it really easy to follow that type of thing at, at the poker table, either live on live or online. And, you know, going back to Albert Hart, he helped design that app. He also wrote, helped me write bluffs. And, you know, he's, he's had great success just using this app at the live poker table, you know, not during the hand, but before the hand, you know, you have, let's say eight big blinds in the cutoff. You can go ahead and plan ahead. Okay. If they fold me, which hands do I shove? And you can look at the app, figure out what you want to do and go from there. So we have lots of new tools coming out at float to turn and we put up training videos. We do webinars and we have a forum there where we discuss whatever questions the students have. Well, you're certainly a busy, a prolific writer. You mentioned Antonio Esfandiari. As you're doing more and more of these side projects, continuing to rack up uh, dollars on the tournament circuit, you get to work with some of these uh, giants of the game. Well, you work with Hel- Phil Helmuth, I know, doing a webinar, a book, I think, as well. What's he like? What are some of these po- top poker players like? And Is there a common thread among them? Are they just driven? What's, why do they get to the top of the game? Well, I think you'll find a lot of the top poker players are very different. Some of them only focus on poker and completely ignore everything else in life. Others are just generally good business people. And um, whenever I did the webinar with Helmuth a while back, we went over a bunch of hands from his World Series of Poker Europe main event win. And I talked to him about three or four months before the webinar because I always try to play him way ahead. And he said, okay, I'm going to make this PowerPoint on my end. You're probably not going to hear hear from me until about the day before the webinar. I'm like, oh, that's scary, because <laughs> I, I never worked with him before. And you know, sure enough, he showed up a day ahead of the webinar, confirmed he's going to be doing it, and turned in the PowerPoint. It looked great, and he showed up for the webinar and, and went off with no problems. So he was very good to work with. Um, he wrote a chapter in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em with Liv Bory on old school versus new school short stack strategies, and you know, he was one of the first ones to turn in his chapter. It was great, and you know, he, he's easy to work with. So when you've developed your poker strategy, I mean, obviously the playing came first. You had great success early, but you've really parlayed that into a full career, man. You've really developed something here. What's your, is this part of a long-range goal? Like, Do you have a philosophy of, I want to leave a poker legacy, like this is me? Uh, what's, your, what's your philosophy in all of this? Well, it's always good to help people, and I know that I would not be where I am today if it was not because of the help of a lot of other people who came before me. So I always, always want to get back to people who want to – learn poker and are not afraid to spend some time studying it. So that's always been important. And also I want to have a family at some point. I'm having my first child in December. So I knew that I was going to not travel and play poker for some amount of time, probably six months or so at least. So I wanted to be able to have something I could do from home that makes money that also helps people. You know, the poker coaching thing falls right into that. So it it seems like a, a logical thing to do. Do you kind of shake your head when you see some of these guys uh, that have a lot of talent, uh, but they seem to get lost through whether it's drugs or alcohol or other casino games that they end up losing at? Um, do you just wonder, you know, get it together, guys, because there's something here if you, if you do it my way kind of thing? There, well, I think a lot of poker players have issues because, I mean, to be a very good, successful poker player, you probably have to be not afraid of gambling, which, you know, is could easily get you in trouble if you take that to other aspects of life. You have to be a little bit inclined to take risks, which could also get you in trouble in other aspects of life. So you have to you have to make sure you handle the issues that you could have away from the table. And I mean that's why in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em we have three chapters devoted purely to mindset. And I think that if you lack a good solid mindset at or away from the table, you're going to have problems and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty big disaster that you see a lot of these poker players get on drugs or have huge gambling issues where they gamble away all their money, and it, and it's, it's terrible is what it amounts to. But you have to understand, some people do not want to be helped, and you know you don't you, you can't try to help everyone. I always find it interesting when you see a top notch poker player that just makes every decision correctly, uh, and they're a winner, and then they, they go to the craps table and have a few drinks and just have fun. You know, I just wonder what what's going on here anyway jonathan little let me get the websites correctly jonathan little poker.com poker and float the turn.com correct all right jonathan little continued success man uh good luck at the world series next year always look forward to your stuff oh one last question twitch how do you what do you think of that website and how do you find doing the uh, live streams twitch is great so i actually started well i attempted to start streaming on twitch about four or five years ago and I was streaming during the World Series, and they banned me because poker was not allowed on Twitch. <laughs> really? So, 
Yeah, this was before anyone was streaming on it. I mean, I always try to be the first one into any new market that I think could be innovative and fun. And I obviously thought Twitch was a good idea. Sure enough, it was. <laughs> and so they banned me. So whatever, you know, I, I obviously get off Twitch. A few years later, it comes around and Jason Somerville blows up on Twitch. He was one of the first people to get on there. And uh, it's mainly because of Scott Ball. Scott Ball is the Twitch poker overlord over there. And he's in charge of, of that department. And he's done a great job cultivating it and getting some of the best players in the world to stream. He makes it easy for you. And it, it's taken off. I think a lot of people enjoy watching people who have you know decent personalities playing poker and they enjoy learning the game in that way so it's it's a it's a good thing i enjoy streaming there i do a home game every week that is free for people to play we give away prizes and it's a lot of fun also i do reviews of the global poker league games sometimes throughout the week so we go through and we try to analyze what the best players are doing this is a way for me to continue learning poker even though i am in america it's a tongue twister i am in america and i can't play online so for that reason i try to do other things that keep me engaged and active in the game despite not actually being able to sit down and click the buttons myself, we get to analyze the best players and make sure we are doing what they are doing. You mentioned the global poker. Like I have to ask you real quick, the first year, I mean, it's gone well, hasn't it? Yeah, it's gone well enough. It didn't go well for my team. Uh, the Las Vegas moneymakers did not do too great. Um, I had a winning record, so that was good. I was a little bit nervous going into it because you know some of the absolute best players in the world are playing and maybe I have confidence issues or something like that. You never really know where you stand, but I was quite nervous about the heads up portion because the players do have to play heads up and from watching some of the other players play i very quickly realized that a lot of them have not studied heads up diligently and i mean i sure i haven't studied heads up diligently but in excelling at no limit hold'em there's a chapter by olivier bousquet who i think is probably the winningest person or one of the winningest people on the global poker league in heads up so i studied with him or just by reading his chapter and talking with him about hands and also there's a bonus chapter that you can get on the website for excelling at no limit hold'em by a guy byron jacobs who is a high stakes hyper turbo heads up sit and go pro and using just the information in those two chapters i had a pretty nice winning record in the heads up games versus some of the best players in the world so it, was, it ended up working out pretty well well as a poker fan i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed this jonathan little thank you so much man thanks for having me